Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Tuesday, Halloween, October 31st, 2017. Quite predictably, the corporate media had a field day with Monday's announcements from the special counsel of the indictments against Manafort and his partner Davis for money laundering and failure to register as foreign agents, and also the announcement that they have a plea deal with George Papadopoulos, a low-level Trump campaign guy, now described as a volunteer, (laughs) who uh, admitted that he lied to the FBI. But the exaggeration, the hype, and the misleading headlines in both television and print media, are quite troubling. These outlets are so invested in the narrative that they have helped generate, based on anonymous leaks and uh, sources that aren't identified, evidence that is not in view. And they're having a field day. And while I have little sympathy for Donald Trump, He really is being given quite, well, a a run through a gauntlet. There's just no question about it. I begin with Bob Perry's analysis. Robert Perry, the editor and founder at ConsortiumNews.com, who I think is the most level-headed skeptic of the Russiagate narrative. He opened his comment with, Russiagate special prosecutor Mueller has turned up the heat on Trump with the indictment of Trump's former campaign manager, for unrelated financial crimes and the disclosure of a guilty plea from a low-level foreign policy advisor for lying to the FBI. George Papadopoulos, a 30-year-old campaign aide who claims to have heard about Russia possessing Hillary Clinton's emails before they became public on the Internet via WikiLeaks. His account is tenuous, and his credibility is, uh, well, it's undermined by the guilty plea. We don't know why he lied to the FBI, mostly about the sequence of events, trying to say that some meetings took place before he joined the Trump campaign. And it's unclear what additional testimony Papadopoulos may have to offer. Because on the one hand, he was an uncredentialed wannabe, who listed on his resume that he had been a participant in the mock United Nations. <laughs> As if that gave him, you know, some kind of, uh, of insight into international affairs. So we ran through some of this yesterday. Papadopoulos got connected to a professor from Britain, actually Scotland, whose name is Joseph Mifsud. He teaches at the University of Stirling, spelled S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G, in Scotland. And they met in Italy, then they met again in March last year in London. And according to Papadopoulos and the commentary in the Mueller plea deal, the professor introduced Papadopoulos to a Russian woman who Papadopoulos thought was Putin's niece. And that appears to be untrue. Then just about a week later, He was seen, and there's a photograph in evidence, at a Washington meeting that was chaired by Senator Jeff Sessions, who was, of course, the early and uh, one of the only members of the Republican Senate caucus who ultimately supported Trump. And his payoff, payback, was being named Attorney General. And at that meeting, Papadopoulos suggested that uh, he could arrange a meeting between Trump and Putin And we're told that Jeff Sessions smacked it down, said, I don't even I don't ever want to hear about that again. (laughs) Now, we have many of these denials. And it remains to be seen if these are lies as well. Jeff Sessions has provably lied about his contact with the Russian ambassador and other related matters in his Senate confirmation testimony. And the tenacious Al Franken was the guy who cornered him. Back to Bob Perry, if Prosecutor Mueller had direct evidence that Papadopoulos had informed the Trump campaign about the Clinton emails, which he asserts he learned from his Russian intermediaries, you would assume that the proof would have been included in Monday's disclosures. 
And since Papadopoulos was flooding the campaign with news about his Russian outreach, you might have expected that he would say something about how helpful the Russians had been in publicizing the Democratic emails. That, of course, is part of the uh, allegation, the narrative that has been created here. I've linked to Bob Perry's piece, and I invite you to read it. Just click through from the the show page at peterbcollins.com. So every morning I uh, go down the driveway with Chloe and we pick up the newspapers and then I have breakfast. And the headline of my local paper, the San Francisco Chronicle, which generally doesn't put national news on the front page, is usually locally focused. Right under the Chronicle logo, the banner headline reads, Charges in Russia Probe. And there are twin stories below that headline. One is an analytical piece about how the Democrats are seizing on the indictments for political ammunition. And the other reads, indictments, colon, ex-Trump aides cited in conspiracy linked to 16 election. Now, this is such a misleading subheadline. It really troubles me. Because, as you know, Manafort and Davis are cited for money laundering. And Papadopoulos has not been accused of a conspiracy. It's Manafort and Davis who are accused of a conspiracy to defraud the federal government in the form of the IRS by not reporting their massive foreign incomes. That's the conspiracy. It's not linked to the 16 election. And so far, Papadopoulos is only agreeing that he lied to the FBI not to any sort of conspiracy with other people on the Trump campaign. Now, if you read the entire article, it uh, goes into details that undermine the accuracy of the headline. But consider how many people will see this newspaper, never read the story, they just read the headline, and the misleading impression they come away with is what will stick. And when a story like this gets circulated on Facebook or on Twitter, it's the headline that people see. And we're going to talk about that in a bit because there are new numbers out about the Facebook posts allegedly linked to Russian interference. And while the numbers have grown, and that's a troubling development, they are still quite minimal. And to me, the big story yesterday was the confirmation that the Podesta Group was one of the firms hired by Paul Manafort as he laundered Ukrainian money through a Belgian center for Ukraine, whatever it's called, the center. And so Tony Podesta, the brother of John Podesta, who managed Hillary's campaign, got his emails hacked. Tony Podesta has stepped down from the Podesta Group, and the firm will carry on with a new name and without Tony. He's going to spend more time with his lawyers. He is likely to be investigated, if not indicted, for his role in enabling the illegal lobbying by Paul Manafort on behalf of the Yanukovych government in Ukraine. And, of course, this exposes Tony Podesta, who is a well-known corporate Democrat, the guy who has greased the wheels for the Clinton machinery that moved the party from supporting labor and working families to the number two corporate party with a lot of adoration for tech titans and other entrepreneurs at the expense of the base of the party. As Tom Frank pointed out in his book, Listen Liberal. And so Podesta, who has not been charged with a crime, I want to be very clear about that, He is uh, going to have a lot of explaining to do about why he accepted over a million dollars from Paul Manafort and accepted the payments through wire transfers from offshore companies. And this, (laughs) unfortunately for Democrats who want to click their heels and call it Mueller Monday and feel like, you know, this is real progress toward some departure for Trump, It only deepens the scandal for Democrats. And I hope you heard yesterday's podcast where I led with Joe Laria's piece from ConsortiumNews.com pointing out that the key elements of the Trump-Russia narrative 
came from firms hired by the Clinton campaign. CrowdStrike was the company that declared that the DNC server was hacked by Russians, never turned that server over to the FBI for some sort of independent analysis, and everybody's just accepted that on faith. And that the dossier paid for by Fusion GPS is really the origin of the Blame Russia meme that became the centerpiece of the Clinton loss, the explanation for it, and it was part of the campaign as well. Now, here's a story, and I, I tried to find it on the New York Times website so I could link to it in the show file and uh, didn't come up with it. But the byline is Scott Shane, who's been on our program before. And in following up on the Papadopoulos plea deal, he writes, court documents revealed that Russian officials alerted the campaign through an intermediary in April 2016 that they possessed thousands of Democratic emails and other dirt on Hillary Clinton. Now, this is an unproven claim. And Shane goes on to shame himself, in my view, by asserting this fact-free but uh, statement of fact. That was two months before the Russian hacking of the Democratic National Committee was publicly revealed and the stolen emails began to appear online. Never, of course, a hint that it could have been a leak, an insider leak. No exploration of the technical analysis that came from Bill Binney and others, the veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, and their report from July of this year. And then the story goes on to build this narrative. By the time of a crucial meeting in June of last year, when Donald Trump Jr. and other campaign officials met with a Russian lawyer, some may have known for weeks that Russia had material likely obtained by illegal hack hacking, the new documents suggested. Now listen to the weasel words here. These are not statements of fact. Some may have known for weeks. Russia had material likely obtained by illegal hacking. The new documents suggested. There is so much innuendo and inference being used here in what passes for journalism. I find it deeply troubling. One more quote. The disclosures added to the evidence pointing to attempts at collaboration be between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. There isn't much evidence. The biggest evidence is the email chain of Don Jr. And from everything we know, nothing came of those discussions to receive dirt on Hillary from the Russian lawyer Veselnitskaya. And so... <laughs> Later in the Shane article, he's the one who introduces Jeff Sessions at that uh, meeting on March 31st in Washington that Papadopoulos attended, apparently the only time he met Trump. I'm quoting now. Several people in the room began to raise questions about the wisdom of a meeting with Putin, noting that Russia was under sanctions from the U.S. Jeff Sessions was counseling Trump on national security. He shut George down. The unnamed advisor said, he said, we're not going to do it, and I'd prefer that nobody speak about this again. Now, maybe they already had a secret back channel to Moscow, and they didn't want a numb nud like Papadopoulos to, you know, expose that. But on the face of it, and this is now backed up by J.D. Gordon, this is in the same damn article, all right, that I'm quoting from Scott Shane in the New York Times. J.D. Gordon, former Pentagon official, worked on the Trump campaign as a national security advisor. He's the one who put together the March 31st meeting. He told the Times, I was surprised to learn what Papadopoulos was up to during the campaign. He obviously went to great lengths to go around me and Senator Sessions. Now, these could be self-serving remarks. And if Papadopoulos has been wearing a wire and recording conversations since he was arrested in July we may get stunning evidence that does link these events and connect the dots. But so far, we have so much speculation passing for journalism, you can tell it irks me. And did Trump actually lapse into a moment of honesty 
when he said few people knew the young low-level volunteer George Papadopoulos, who has already proven to be a liar? (laughs) Now, Trump is the ultimate self-serving pathological liar. But occasionally, (laughs) as I say, he may lapse into a moment of honesty. And, of course, he tries to shift the, the focus to Hillary and Uranium One and all that stuff. And I understand his often successful efforts to divert our attention. So we'll see where the Papadopoulos story goes and who else he might implicate. As I say almost daily, I will follow the evidence. And I will acknowledge when compelling evidence is presented. Meanwhile, today there are hearings on Capitol Hill and Facebook, Twitter, Google. Their leaders are all being grilled by angry senators who, of course, buy 100% into the Russiagate narrative. And it is embarrassing that uh, Facebook has revised its numbers upward of the number of people who viewed alleged messages from alleged shadowy Russian company linked to the alleged Kremlin. (laughs) That murky company is the Internet Research Agency. We're now told that it posted 80,000 pieces of divisive content shown to about 29 million people. Now, I want to make a really important couple of comments here about the way these numbers are manipulated. Because in these stories, than the one I'm using is from the New York York Times, they often will enter, uh, how do I put it, They, they substitute the term impressions for people. And Facebook served up 11 trillion posts between, in the period, when the report is now that, uh, 29 people saw that and then shared it. And after they shared it, the total reach was 126 million impressions. But when you read Facebook, you know, in between the pictures of people's breakfast or lunch and cute little cat videos and all of the bizarre stuff that shows up on your news feed fed by the people who are in your friend network, Nobody reads everything that is in their Facebook news feed. So these are numbers that represent the maximum potential. But I would argue that a fraction of people actually saw this. And when you put their total number of 126 million against 11 trillion posts, well, that is hardly significant statistically. And on Twitter, they have reported that uh, there were 2,700 accounts that posted 131,000 tweets that led to uh, 1.4 million election-related tweets linked to Russia over a three-month period. And the total number there is an approximate 288 million views. And I don't know about you, but I breeze through my Twitter feed and I rarely click on anything. I absorb, uh, you know, who posted it and what's it about. Then there is YouTube, owned by Google. The Russian-linked videos, 1,100 of them, received fewer than 310,000 views. Only 3% of the videos had more than 5,000 views. So that's what uh, people these days call a nothing burger. So I am not exonerating Facebook or other social media outlets. They need to improve transparency. We need to be able to see where a post came from, and particularly if it is a paid post, who paid for it. To its credit, Google is not going to take any further action against RT, which apparently does have a pretty big audience on YouTube. But Twitter has banned RT and Sputnik from advertising on its service. I think they're allowed to post. They're just not allowed to advertise. And in this bizarre piece, advice headlined, Russian agents crushed it on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube during the election. 
Now, keep in mind that the numbers that Facebook has released, only 46% of the total appeared before Election Day. The vast majority came after the election when it made no difference. And when they, you know, inter intersperse people and impressions. So, for example, Vice shows that Facebook had these Russian posts that reached 126 million people. Some of those are the same people who got more than one of these posts. We have no way of parsing that, but we know that that 126 is not a number of unique viewers. And then we need to add further context here. That the Trump campaign, by its own admission, spent over $85 million on paid posts on Facebook. We don't know the dollar amount for the Clinton campaign, but they had a very active David Brock Correct the Record super PAC with dark money, unlimited contributions from unknown individuals or corporations. And the other advantage that Trump had is that he accepted help from the social media companies. They embedded their sharpest people who gave advice on the best way to target some of the ugly messages that came from the Trump campaign. And as you can tell, I like to exhaust the domestic suspects for manipulation of our election before we start to blame Russia or anybody else. Over at the Washington Post, Margaret Sullivan, who did distinguish herself in her previous job as the public editor at the New York Times, is not so distinguished today. She posits we need to admit the obvious. If there had been no Facebook spreading Russian propaganda, there might well be no President Trump. Now, I find that extremely far-fetched. There are so many reasons. Consider the billions of dollars of free media that Trump got, not just from Morning Joe. Every network bent over backwards and gave Trump huge advantages in messaging and in the amount of time that he was given on screen. And he was pretty good at driving wedges between Americans with the divisive positions that he took. And all that is supposed to be meaningless compared to what is alleged to be relatively modest Russian intervention via social media? Here's another example of domestic interference in the election. Ari Berman has moved from the nation, which is pretty allergic to hard-hitting reporting on election manipulation, over to Mother Jones, based here in San Francisco. And Mother Jones is in deep promoting the Russiagate narrative. Nevertheless, in a lengthy, deep dive that I've linked to in the show file for today's podcast, Ari Berman follows a voter in Milwaukee, an African-American woman named Andrea Anthony, who had lost her driver's license just a couple of days before she went to vote. And because of the strict new voter ID law in Wisconsin, her vote didn't count. She was given a provisional ballot, but was not able to provide the documentation for it to count. Berman details that Wisconsin, which was delivered to Trump by 23,000 votes, saw its lowest turnout in presidential cycles since 2000. And the stat, uh, statistics argue that this could have been the pivotal difference that delivered Wisconsin to Trump, one of the three key states that uh, were instrumental in that result. Berman notes that there was almost zero coverage of voter suppression in the mainstream media. It never came up in any of the 25 presidential debates. A federal judge has blocked the voter ID law in Wisconsin, noting that 9% of all registered voters didn't have the required forms of ID and that black voters were about 50% more likely than whites to lack these kinds of ID. So it's a very serious article. And the bottom line is that it makes a strong case that Wisconsin would have gone for Clinton were it not for the extreme voter suppression tactics that worked. 
I mean, why go to all these great lengths to blame Russia when the culprits are right here in the United States? Today, I'm releasing an in-depth interview with my buddy Roger Schuler, the hard-hitting journalist who has exposed so much corruption in his home state of Alabama. And he, in a recent post, revealed that Karl Rove, the Chamber of Commerce, and the Riley Gang in Alabama have quietly deserted Roy Moore, the Republican nominee for the Senate election on December 12th, to replace Jeff Sessions. And they are quietly backing his Democratic opponent, Doug Jones. And it's quite a revelation. Here is Roger Schuler describing Doug Jones as a Trojan horse. And Jill uh, Simpson, who uh, your readers probably know, played a big, big role in the Siegelman case, essentially really brought it to public attention uh, that uh, there, there had been a, she was on a, a uh, conference call uh, where people were planning the Siegelman prosecution. Uh, and she has been my, my number one source on uh, about Doug Jones. And I, I've had, I've been reporting on Doug Jones and his ties to the right, what we call the Riley machine in Alabama, uh, the former governor, Bob Riley, and his son, Rob Riley, who I call Uday, uh, in, uh, <laughs> he's should have been born in Iraq. Uh-huh. Uh, but, um, I mean, just truly, truly dreadful, awful, awful people. And Doug Jones is in bed with them, um, primarily through, uh, well, a number of things, but one of a, uh, the Health South case from several years ago, uh, Richard Scrushy was the co-defendant in the Siegelman criminal matter, right. and he was the former CEO of Health South. And you you've interviewed him, and uh, but Jones and Rob Riley uh, joined uh, with a cast of other lawyers in a civil case, federal civil case, and they made a whole bunch of money off that and. So, and Jill Simpson has said that 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 really gave Jones the uh, financial clout to even begin to think about running for U.S. Senate. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, he's a uh, kind of a Trojan horse. Uh, you know, you know, being put up as a Democrat, and Joe Biden has come to Alabama to support him, and and uh, he's a former U.S. attorney under the Clintons, uh, under Bill Clinton, uh, but. Uh, he's he's not at all what a what a progressive Democrat would would think of. The full interview with Roger Schuler covers the Doug Jones Roy Moore campaign. Uh, Schuler's exposure of people who subscribe to the cheating website Ashley Madison and how Ashley Madison appears to be uh, using Facebook to block the distribution of Roger Schuler's articles, and it happened to me just last week. And also the latest victim of the Republican mob in Alabama, a guy named Todd Henderson, who was elected district attorney, then convicted of perjury in a bizarre case uh, related to a divorce. It's all in this new in-depth interview, available for subscribers today at PeterBCollins.com, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spreaker. And it's all made possible by people who support me with your subscriptions. People like Benny Alto, who has multiple monthly subscriptions. Robert Ripner just renewed his annual subscription. I recently heard from Patrick Garay, who lives in Europe and subscribes. And I've got the long-running support of Bob Donjacour, who has largely recovered from his bicycle accident last year. I invite you to join their ranks. I need your help to keep it all going. So visit PeterBCollins.com, click on Menu, follow the links to become a subscriber, and you can make uh, your own decision about what fits your budget. A couple of briefs here. The former leader of Catalonia, uh, Carles Puigdemont, who was deposed on orders of the Madrid government last week, he showed up in Brussels today at the European Union, where he's trying to generate support, and I think that's a lost cause, the European Union is firmly behind the uh, uh, rigid and ruthless government in Madrid, and I don't f- think he'll find much sympathy there. He also may apply for asylum to avoid being prosecuted for sedition in Spain. 
Steny Hoyer is the number two to Nancy Pelosi in the Democratic leadership in the House of Representatives. And according to The Intercept and Lee Fung, he is working against the resolution that is number 81, which would uh, uh, use the a provision of the War Powers Act to end U.S. military involvement for the Saudi-led war in Yemen. And according to Colin Powell's former chief of staff, Lawrence Wilkerson, Hoyer is leading the opposition uh, uh, among Democrats to this uh, bipartisan effort. And I find that deeply troubling. The leader of the Kurdish separatist movement in northern Iraq, Masoud Barzani, has resigned in a letter to his regional parliament. And this produced uh, a mini riot by his supporters outside of the uh, parliament in, I think, Mosul uh, over the last couple of days. And I remain puzzled why the Kurdish fighters, who were the most effective against the Islamic State when the Iraqi army was useless and melting away, why they didn't stand and fight and put up any resistance to the put-down by the Baghdad government just a week or two ago. If you remember, last March, early April, the U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, the Secretary of State Rexon Tillerson, they both announced that we were no longer seeking to, uh, well, seeking regime change or to oust Bashar al-Assad as the leader of Syria. And a few days later, Syria was accused of using a chemical weapon in Khan Shakun. As you know, I remain skeptical of that claim. But now Tillerson is back to uh, square one. The United States wants a whole and unified Syria with no role for Bashar al-Assad in the government. The reign of the Assad uh, family is coming to an end. The only issue is how that should be brought about. Really? What leverage do you have? Assad has prevailed in the multifaceted civil war. He's still fighting some factions in the Damascus suburbs in a brutal way. And I don't support Assad in any manner. But just how does the U.S. propose to take him out, and who do we plan to replace him with? I find it bizarre. Well, I have a few more stories I'd love to share with you, but I'm running long here. And I'll close with this one. Yesterday I mentioned that I've been aware for several years about Kevin Spacey's sexual orientation and his history of coming on strong to young males who he encounters encounters, uh, on the set. And my source is a very reliable person who directed several episodes of House of Cards. And I read to you yesterday with some um, doubt a statement from the creator of House of Cards, that he had never seen anything or heard anything about Kevin Spacey hitting on males and uh, being aggressive in that uh, process on the set of House of Cards. Uh, I'm dubious about that. But yesterday, Netflix announced the obvious. House of Cards has run out of gas. I don't know about you, but I was fascinated by the first three seasons. And after he became president or started running for president... Uh, I just thought that the series had lost uh, its its uh, secret sauce. Now, Netflix says the decision to end the series was reached months ago, but they waited until Kevin Spacey, in response to an allegation that years ago he assaulted a 14-year-old child actor, and he used the opportunity to officially confirm his homosexuality. And this has raised the hackles of many gay activists who say that linking the child predatory behavior with his sexual orientation has set back the gay rights movement by 50 years. Now, that may be a little extreme, but I think it is uh, an indication of how strongly people feel. Thanks for listening to my news and comment podcast, delivered free every day and available on YouTube. I'm Peter B. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails